All right, without further ado, boys. Thanks, man. Hi, uh, Defcon. Hi, Defcon. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us today. It's Sunday, it's a bit more chill. Some of us are already flying home. Some of us are recovering from Angover. And the last of us are here. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, there is also some zombies there. Okay, so today we are presenting the, the results of our research, uh, which is, and we present a new approach for stack spoofing targeting Windows on s like specifically 64 bit architecture of Windows. Uh, who we are? Uh, we are three friends. I'm Alessandro Magnosi, uh, principal security consultant in BSI where I do mostly red teaming, uh, offensive tool development and white box assessments. So source code review, fuzzing and stuff like that. In my free time I work for, um, I, I maintain some tools, some offensive tools in Porchetta industry which is um, uh, an initiative by Marcello Salvari um, to support open source developers and in the rest of my time I'm a bug, un bug hunter for uh, Cinec Red Team. Uh, then there is my colleague. Hey, my name is Arash. Uh, I work at CyberArk. I have kind of a dual role there. I'm very fortunate. I get to do a lot of threat hunting, detection engineering, and I also get to do red teaming when time allows for it. And our friend Thanos unfortunately couldn't be here today. He also contributed to this work. He's a uh, red teamer at Netitude. He was also great and he contributed a lot here. So we, we want to make sure he's mentioned. So here we are. Um, so a bit of story about this. All of this started back in 2022 when uh, Namazo, a security researcher and developer, uh, released a POC on Twitter, like an image, uh, where it was showing like a technique which then we uh, popularized them, um, fix also a bit. Um, and um, this actually, like we were very interested in this research, in his research, in his work. So we reached down to it, we started developing this in-house. Um, of course we didn't know a lot about about was what was involved with the technique. So we started this uh, research and development uh, project. Uh, we developed our own like version of the, um, of the technique showed by Namazo. And after that we uh, continue researching on this technique. We will uh, also present indeed, we will also present uh, like the detection part for this uh, technique and other additional uh, research avenues that we researched. So just to give you a bit of background, let's define what stack spoofing is, what we, what we mean with stack spoofing. So of course you know that when you start a process on Windows, you know, when you execute a binary, you uh, create a process in Windows which is a container and then one or more threads are tasked with executing the real code of, uh, of the program. Every thread maintains a call stack which is an area of memory organized as a stack that maintains the information about all active subroutines in a given time for a given thread. And what we do with spoofing is that we want to, um, we want to create, to substitute the frames with fake ones and this is usually never done for non-malicious activity. This is always done for uh, malware to hide the, uh, the execution flow or similar stuff. So you will see here four different frames and why I put this here is just to let you know what like to let you see what a call stack is and you will see that there are certain things that are like uh, that appears that are common to uh, to a call stack. For example we define this first two threads for this talk. We will just talk about these two frames as thread initialization frames which are usually at the bottom of the stack of the call stack. Uh, like at the, at the top actually of the, uh, of the call stack. Then you have internal frames of a specific programs that we will refer to this during the talk as uh, main modules frames. And then you have the, um, the frames related to uh, uh, a, call, a call API, uh, an API call. So why this is, um, how this is calculated by Windows. Um, so the stack is uh, evaluated by Windows using an unwinding algorithm, an unwinding algorithm and this is, this uses the information contained in the p data section of a binary or related DLL 
And in this pdata section, you usually have uh, an exception directory. We contain all the information about the function, specifically uh, information about the um, like every every entry uh, runtime function entry in this table contains the information about the begin address of a function, the end address, and a pointer to a structure, which is the wind uh, wind infrastructure that contains. Um, information about the size of the prolog, the count of codes, and all the infor and all the operations that were performed in a prolog of a specific function. Um, now, why this is important? I mean, this is used by uh, by Windows to manage exceptions. Uh, but what we are interested in is the usage that this is done to calculate the call stack at runtime. And to calculate that, what happens is that Windows evaluate the frame, um, a call, a call frame size, a call frame size, uh, dynamically using collecting the information, collecting the codes, so the operation in the prolog that actually affected the, uh, that impacted the frame size. And the operation are usually uh, push, of course. If you push a register, you subbing uh, eight on the stack. And if you allocate, if you allocate memory, you're subbing from the uh, from RSP. So you allocate state on the stack. So these two main operations are what modify the the frame size. And then there is the push mac frame, which is really not interesting for for our talk, but yeah, it's another it's another it's another operation that impact the frame size. And this is important. This is needed in in Windows because if you remember 32-bit architecture, um, you in the prolog you always have like a push EBP and then you uh, you save the EBP, the base pointer. So you have the base pointer pointed to the um, to the to the top of the to the top of the frame, and then you have the R, the ESP pointing to the to the to the bottom of the stack, and this is used for. Um, and like the, the contrary, but yeah, this is used to, this is used for, uh, this is very useful to uh, evaluate the cold stack because you can just navigate back the chain of EBP that are pushed on the stack. But in 64-bit, this is not possible because RSP is used both as a base pointer and a stack pointer. So to evaluate the cold stack, we need to um, recursively get the size of uh, uh, of a stack frame and then recover the return address and then evaluate again the call stack frame and then uh, the return address and traverse it back like this. So why we are interested in the call stack? We are interested in the call stack because when you execute malware on Windows you can generate some anomalies that can help with detection. So we have in memory execution can be detected if because when you inject code in memory, if you're using especially a, um, to, to, to run a malware, you uh, do process injection, for example, or code injection, and you're using an executable section on the heap, what happens is that that section will not have a module associated. So it, th that, that executable memory is not backed by a, a file on disk. If there is no file, there is no pdata section. If there is no pdata section, there is no exception directory. If there is no exception directory, there are none, like there is no way, there is no information that the unwinding algorithm a winding algorithm can use to um, dynamically get the size of that specific code. So what you happen, what will happen is that, oh, too much, sorry. Uh, what will happen is that you will have something like this. So you will have a frame at a certain point that is not resolvable and this is associate, associated with, uh, with an unbacked memory region. Uh, the other thing you can, uh, you can, the other anomaly that you can detect from the cold stack is when you use uh, direct or indirect syscalls. And we are referring to direct system calls, actually direct anti function execution, like get proc address, anti DLL, anti function, and then execute the function pointer is calling directly the anti function. And this will generate a cold stack that misses the, um, uh, that misses the, um, why? Sorry for that. Uh, that misses the um, what we the the frames associated with high level API call. This stack frame is is also generated if you're using an indirect system call. So if you're just locating the syscall instruction in NTDLL and then you jump to it. So the frame the stack the stack is pretty much the the same and it misses the high level uh, API frames of course. But these are the anomalies. When you want to detect this, well, you can do a periodic scan. So you have a tool that stop the frames, uh, that stop the threads uh, system-wide, uh, get the context and analyze the stack frame. 
You can have a conditional scan, which is a periodic scan with an added filter to filter for specific kind of threads that are in specific weight states, for example. Or you can use hooking or kernel tracing, which is instead uh, done uh, dynamically when a system call is involved. You can use something like EWTI or another uh, kind of uh, driver to get the uh, to get the user mode uh, call stack and hunt for detections. So, two like as tax spoofing uh, previous research on the topic uh, lead to the development of techniques to defend from specific scan periodic scan like stack truncation stack cloning and stack hiding or uh, to defend against specific um, specific specific rule based detection on the cold stack when executing a specific API. So stack truncation was probably the first one used and it's an, evol an evolution is a variation of uh, normal return address spoofing where the where we replace the malicious frame with a with a trampoline uh, usually in a DLL or in an executable and then we nullify the return uh, the return address prior to the um, to the trampoline. This way we have a cut call stack like this uh, which is surely better than having garbage in the call stack but it still uh, it still has a defect which is this this stack is not um, unwindable. So we still can have a detection for this reason. Uh, then we have stack crafting. Stack crafting instead is a technique that is usually asynchronous. Like we have a system, uh, there is a specific function that get called, um, and there are specific processes using that function in a legitimate way. So what we do is that we record that execution, that call stack at that point, and when we need to call our target function, we just craft the same kind of uh, of cold stack so that we can in this way we can bypass detection like sysmon hunting for specific cold stack trays or uh, similar similar detection. Then we have stack cloning this as well has been uh, developed to defend from conditional scanning and the idea is simple usually our implants go to sleep for most of like usually sleep most of the time. So when I want to sleep using a, a delay execution like wait delay execution using a sleep or using a wait user requested wait state using uh, wait for single object well, what I need to do is just hunt for a thread that is already with that state that is sleeping with that state and then clone is cold stack. This will make the cold stack perfect perfectly legitimate uh, or appear apparently legitimate so uh, we will be defended by conditional scan that on for sleeping beacons. Stack hiding is similar but it uses uh, another another kind of uh, approach. So the approach is that I will transform my thread in a I have a malicious code executing in memory. Uh, I transform my thread in a fiber so I have a fiber thread now and then I create another fiber with a legitimate cold stack that I use just for sleeping. So when I need to sleep I just switch to the fiber thread to the other fiber that I created for sleeping and then this process gets repeated when I need to go back from sleep. And this is what you have like this is the uh, this is the fiber with a legitimate cold stack and this is the code uh, in in memory. So they you can see that there are two different area two different memory area for the stacks uh, and just one is active at a time. So what is our contribution? Today we want to present two techniques uh, full moon and half moon that are designed to uh, obfuscate the stack at runtime. Uh, to avoid detection, kind of base detection, uh, mostly, uh, or hooking detection. So stack moving has some properties, like it hides the caller from memory, it obfuscates the stack, so it's difficult to understand which kind of uh, call stack was actually taken, was actually generated when executing a specific ABI or system call, and then it has an, hour, an auto restore, an auto restore technique. So usually uh, we use ROP to restore the stack. We will see this is not always possible, but yeah. Uh, most most of them uses like most for most for the most part is use ROP to restore the stack. So full movement is the first technique, and it operates like that. We have a function that we want to spoof, an API or whatever, and what we do, of course, of course, we are executing this from um, from our main module that can be in memory or can be like in this case it seems like it it's a program, but it can be even injected in memory. There is no there is no problem. Uh, this is for main module if you remember I'm I'm referring to all the frames generated by the main module so it's the like I just packed all the uh, all the internal frames for the main module 
And what I do is I select three frames, well actually four to be a bit more stealthy in our intentions but the needed are three and um these are as an SF an SF, a set for FP reg frame, a push reg frame, other sync frame and then yeah we added the conceal frame just to be a bit more stealthy. And what they do is just at a certain point in the set FP reg frame what we are doing is that we are restoring the base pointer again and so this happens through this kind of call which is mob rbp rsp where we save our current rsp which contains the uh, address on the stack that contains the return address of this frame and then with the second frame the push FP, fp reg frame the push reg frame we push rbp on the stack now what happens this creates an opportunity for us to modify the address that was pushed in memory because that RBP now is on the stack. If you modify it, this will be evaluated by the unwinding algorithm as the address that should be used to restore RSP. And this gives us an opportunity to tamper with this so that if this RSP points back to our thread initialization frame, practically what happens is that the main module will completely disappear from the cold stack. Okay, this doesn't solve the memory problem. So if you have you know unbacked memory section this will not resolve that okay but from the cold stack is not visible anymore because doing just this will of course corrupt the execute the return flow of the program we use a the sync gadget which is a job gadget here a jump rbx to hijack the return flow so that we can execute a restore function which on which, which is under our control and this restore function will reset the main module to what it was and just remove the fake frames. So this is the uh the the uh the uh, technique in a nutshell. And this is how the cold stack is set up and as you can see there are the thread initialization frames and then there is no executable there is just kernel base and these frames are all generated by, by our algorithm. Now these frames uh have some logical inconsistencies that can be used for detection. And Michael Lick will. Sure. So I'll talk to you guys a little bit about the IOCs and why this doesn't necessarily create a perfect stack, but does create a good looking stack. So if we look at the slide we have currently, you can see the spoofed frame, the kernel based.dll open state explicit. And you actually see a location that plus 0x39d, that's an offset. So what's going to happen is that's the return address we would return to in order to continue execution within the stack. Now, why is this relevant and why is this an IOC? Because technically, if we, well, let's talk about what a call stack is. Based on the name, a call stack is, of course, a series of calls. So you will see an API call making another API call making another API call. And this is often so you can debug and you can see at what API you may have crashed, at what section you may have issues, et cetera. So it is supposed to show a series of calls to other functions. Now, if we look at that spoofed frame, the kernel based.dll open state explicit, we go to the return address, but the return address isn't going to have a call because the return address is going to be after the call. That's where we continue execution or we return. So what we do is we actually go before the return address and we try to look at that little move byte pointer that we see there for the open state explicit function. We can see that that is not a call. And not only is that not a call to another function, it is certainly not a call to create private object security with multiple inheritance. So immediately this becomes suspicious. And this isn't something a legitimate dev would ever do because it would just hinder their debugging process. It would impact them negatively. So this is something we would only see an attacker wanting to perform. Now while I say this is an IOC, it's really kind of a difficult IOC. You know, it's hard to deploy at scale. It's not really something you can hunt in your EDRs. And if you observe this on every single function, there would be very massive performance hits. So while this is an IOC, we're not necessarily sure there's a realistic detection method yet outside of the possibility of a utility such as Intel Pin Tracer, which does it a little lower level than the operating system itself. 
So if we look here, we can tell you what we're looking for. These are the call opcodes. This is basically the assembly that we're looking for in our eclipse detector to observe full moonwalk. So we're looking for specific types of calls. Um, that mod rex w basically determines if it's like a long call or a short call, for example. And then we can see a relative 32 call. The call r64 calls a register. And then of course the system call, the ntdll lowest level call that you will often see because ntdll often makes the syscall for you. But if we were to observe there we would see a syscall instruction. So this is the algorithm for all you PhD people out there. Um, basically the idea is we're looking for very specific things in our algorithm, not just for stack spoofing, but the detector is looking for an invalid stack period. And not just by unwinding, because as we know we can actually fool the unwinder as previously shown. So what do we look for? We're looking for unbacked memory regions, that's the reflective injection detected. Unbacked memory means some injection was performed, a private Rx commit memory region was created, this isn't backed to any files on disk, no DLLs, no EXEs, so we consider this malicious off and we consider some injection of some sort. There can be false positives with this to be clear. Um, JITs, browsers, you know, C sharp, you'll, you'll see these private commit memory regions getting created and executing code. So while this does help, it's not foolproof to be clear. The next is we actually look for the desync gadget because what full moon walk actually does is it desyncs the stack with basically a ROP gadget in order to be able to effectively craft its own stack for restoration as well. So we can just look for that gadget and often that can be an IOC as well. Additionally, the call mismatch detected as previously stated. Um, message box A is going to make a very specific call to the next function. If we look at message box A, we look at the previous instruction and it's not the right call to the next function, that's an IOC. And the wrong address detected as well. If the address is just not a call, if it's not strict, if it's not correct, you know, it, it has to be a call and it has to be a call in, a, in the correct order. I, I actually think I m uh, mixed up the mismatch and the wrong address, but the idea is the same. In one, we're basically looking for a call that's not a call, or we're basically looking, is it actually calling the next function? Because that's what a call stack is supposed to do. This function calls that function, calls that function for investigation. So this is full moonwalk running. We have a successfully spoofed message box A. We're even telling you we're spoofing this message box A. Now we run our detector. On the left, you can see our, spore, our four spoofed frames, frames 8, 9, 10, and 11. Our detector first catches create file internal as a spoofed call because the previous address does not, the previous instruction is not a call. And here's what's interesting. We also get PSS query snapshot. Now if you look at the addresses, as I said before, this does unwind. If you look at the PC address for PSS query snapshot, it matches the return address for the create file function. So an unwinder is going to think this is legitimate. This is in fact what was called. This is in fact where it needs to return. But our detector knows better. Our detector goes there and says not only is there no call, there's absolutely no call to create file W. All we've done is fooled the Microsoft Unwinder into thinking this looks legitimate. So if you actually use Microsoft's built-in unwinding, this is what we did here, it looks legitimate. We only caught this because our detector is looking for more. Now, there are a few false positives as mentioned before. Um, we see this a lot with JITs specifically. We saw this in WinDBG. It seemed to be, uh, have a lot of JITing going on. We can see right here one of the processes for WinDBG has just these two entirely unbacked memory regions. Um, for reasons unknown to us, it appears JITs don't always fully unwind and that these memory regions just always exist. And so there will be false positives with JIT processes as usual. So we did testing to see what the false positive rate actually was. We wanted to determine is this feasible, is this something we can actually do without, you know, overloading a team. And we determined kind of, you know, it's, it's not too bad. 
So we'll see, we, we tested this on five different machines. Uh, standard just means it was a standard Windows user machine. This is not a developer. This is just a person who logs on, watches video, does work on Word documents, and that's it. Uh, dev is actually a developer, somebody who installs Visual Studio, sets up Postman, installs WinDBG Preview. And again, you know, it makes sense. The developer is going to have a higher false positive rate, they have more JITs, they're developing more tools that are going to have weird unbacked memory regions. You know, no programming isn't really perfect and there's really no catch all for this. We can see on Win 10, the false positive rate is actually a little lower than Win 11 Enterprise. Um, but you know, we do see that for the dev machines it actually decreased a bit. As far as Windows Server goes, we see a pretty high false positive rate. That's likely associated with you know, you're deploying your web servers on this, you're deploying your .NET applications, you're, you're deploying all sorts of stuff that's going to sort of increase that rate of false positives. And, and you know, just to end this, as far as detecting all this goes, it's like I said, for a hunter behind an EDR, this isn't really telemetry we get. Um, some EDR provide call stacks for very specific functions so as to not be too intensive. And we can sort of hunt on that and look for unbacked memory regions. But as far as it goes for full moonwalk, we just don't really have an effective way to check every single function call and ensure that this call is actually a valid call. So in a way, this unwindability is pretty effective in today's age. So after, <clears throat> after developing the detection, we actually talked about uh, other kind of avenues that we could, where we could actually make use of um, this uh, kind of knowledge. And so as we've seen, um, except for the execute, like in-memory execution, there was another problem which was the correct stack frames uh, allocated when we execute an high-level API instead of going with the indirect Cisco. So we developed this uh, additional technique which is an extension and it's half moonwalk. Half moonwalk is because we're just doing half of the technique. We are just considering what is mm, half, like what is what we are calling and not really the caller. And so what half moonwalk does is that we can always go to like we can always match uh, an high level API to a Cisco. Uh, so half moonwalk takes I as input um, an high level API name and its relevant uh, Cisco instruction uh, and it will trace uh, all like it will, tra it, will, it will trace the execution flow from the high level API until it finds the relevant uh, um, anti function. And what we're doing is that doing this tracing we also collect all the information, all the exception information, so all the information in the P data section related to the prologue. And what we do is that we re recreate the frames the, of the high level APIs before executing an indirect system call. So how we do that, we just need to literally emulate the prologue of the high level API. And what happens doing this is that we can recreate the same kind of uh, call stack, perfectly, perfectly legit this time. So we also respect the, um, the the location of the return address, which is placed after the call, and the call is actually matching what it's being called. But we never call the high level API. So this is literally a syswhisper type of indirect system call, just with added spoofed frame for the high level API. So now we have a little problem that we will solve afterward for the emulate system call which of course is a function that will do this spoofing and it's visible as for now. So we will solve this later. But um, so we are concerned about the return flow though. If we add these frames they will return back to where they are supposed to return. But we didn't actually execute the high level API we just emulated the prologue. Would that be enough to actually ensure that the return flow is correct? Well, yes and no. Uh, so there are three strategies we can use. Uh, one is the return, uh, place the return on a winding. So this is terribly worded. Uh, what I mean is that we place the return address of the epilogue, uh, which of course is just deallocating the, the, the prologue. It's just like literally rolling back the prologue. So that will work. But we will be detected by Eclipse again then because uh, we need to move the return address not after the call but on the epilogue itself. Uh, 
Uh, the other, and this is what it happens, instead we have the call to uh, empty protect return memory in, in this case, instead of placing the return here where it's supposed to do, because there are all these tests, we just move it to the epilogue. And this works, of course, but as I said, we, are, we can be detected again by, by Eclipse with this, because if we analyze the instruction before this return address, it won't be a call anymore. So we have a second strategy which is the targeted setup that works even better but it doesn't scale and the targeted setup is just like I can analyze what are the post uh, call checks. What I call post call checks are literally all these checks, all these if that are executed after the call. Uh, and to avoid them from you know branching, to avoid the branching I just say what I need to patch, I just see what I need to patch and then I patch it before actually executing the call. Now this is, this is pretty much, it, it works but you can't do it anytime and honestly it doesn't scale at all because you would need to know what thing to patch every time you execute an arbitrary function. This doesn't scale at all. So the latest thing we can do is, I don't know what is happening, I'm sorry. As a so another thing I can do is using our breakpoints. Um, so what it happens is that I, I place a breakpoint on return and we actually say sliding our breakpoints because we don't know how many frames we need to emulate. So if they are more than four, of course I need a strategy to out update the other breakpoints otherwise I, I will miss some frame. Uh, anyway, what it happens is that I place, a ret I place another breakpoint at the return address. When the function returns back, I just execute an exception handler that just execute the epilogue, emulate the epilogue and then force the instruction pointers to return. And that this way, this, this, sc this scales well but I need always executable, I, I always need executable memory because I always need to make the um, the exception handler like somewhere. I need to store the exception handler somewhere. So I always need some executable memory around, floating around. So um, as I said before, um, the, we also had a sort of a problem with the emulate system call because we said, well, there is no function, if you remember before, there is no, like this thing is actually pushing this frame and then jumping to the syscall instruction here. So if someone is looking at this emulate system call, it can be problematic. So what we can create is an opaque architecture that as, this is a if, but you can place a switch case for example, um, that just will, when, ex when this is executed, it will execute, so now we are stepping through here, okay, to emulate system call W, this is a frameless function, it will execute something on the stack, it will corrupt the stack doing this, but it will grab the position of this frame function and it will just swap itself, swap the frame of the frame function with the frame function. This way it will restore the stack, the call stack that will appear legi legitimate and here we have what legitimates this like sequence of call is that we have a jump here to the restore. Uh, proc. Of course, this is opaque. It's not that great. But what we want, what is really important about this is that even if we have something with no frame information associated, as long as the stack size, so the modification on the stack, are equal to something that we are creating and is framed, we can always replace it and fix the cold stack. Why this is important? Because there are ways we can do that using standard windows DLLs. So we selected this in particular because it's very, um, it, it was already abused in exploit development to bypass uh, uh, exploit mitigation, um, uh, it's part of the exploit mitigation developed by windows and it's the call, it's the call to NDR server call too. So we can use this kind of architecture here to completely hide our caller again. So how this may work? So if we can enforce in our implant, maybe a stage zero, if we can enforce in our implant this constraint, uh, so we want the, our implant at any time, the internal, the sides of the frames, of the internal frames of our implant, they should always match the sides of the under 
stop called two stack. As you can see here, you have a lot of space allocated on the spy on the, on the stack for this function. If we can enforce this uh, this constraint, uh, we can start a thread pointing to our shell coding memory, which is our implant. We can force these first two frames in the thread itself. Then we can start our implant. And when the implant needs to spoof a function, what we can do is call the uh, call alt moon, execute alt moon, where whereby the first uh, frame spoofed is the invoke function, which is an arbitrary call to anything, and then execute alt moon with the rest of the AI level API frame and eventually call the spoof function. So what this creates is a completely legitimate call stack where we have the frame in the thread frame the, the thread initialization frames then we have the first two call to ndr stop call uh, ndr server call 2 and ndr stop call 2 then we have the execution of our implant we have the return address spoofed with ndr stop call to stack which completely hides our implant frames and then we have alpha moon executed with invoke and virtual and all the eye level all the all the remaining uh eye level api frames and then we have the system call again executed this will hide completely the um the caller as well so we are just we're just going back and try to you know complete what alf moon was not doing so hiding the caller now the only drawback of this is that you always in order to restore the functionality of the program on return you always need uh, an hardware breakpoint placed on invoke. So you can handle these two frames as much as, as, as you want, as we shown before. So target at setup uh, or, um, or uh, return on epilog or, um, or, exception, or exception handlers. But this in invoke function, you always need an exception handler to actually restore the return address of the under stop, stop call to stack and return to our implant. Just a word about chat. Um, we are studying a lot uh, into chat with shadow stack mitigation and indirect branching tracing, indirect branch tracing. And so far, we didn't find a way around chat. Uh, it's not surprising. So, what happens with chat is that there is a shadow stack, of course, a clone, like it maintains a list of all the return address uh, that are placed just after a call. And when on return, it will check if this return address matches the user mode, um, like the user mode, the uh, writable, the normal call stack. And if they don't match, there will be a CP fault uh, that will crash the program, that we will exec exit the program. Um, there is another, another thing that is concerning about Intel chat is that uh, with indirect branch tracing, there is no easy way to modify the instruction pointer as well. We can't just use exception handler as, as much as we do now. Uh, but the good thing is that even in uh, machine supporting chat so far, uh, there, will, there are always uh, processes that are not chat enabled like browsers and stuff like that that we can still abuse for executing this technique. So key takeaways, you will, you always have the public POC available here. Uh, this will be announced with additional uh, POCs after this talk, so in the coming days. Um, this POC of course is uh, like both of the techniques are usually uh, like are, have been developed and designed to obfuscate the stack at runtime. So if you're planning of obfuscate the stack when you're going on sleep, probably I'd rather use the stack cloning or the stack hiding and the reason is, well as you see, there are certain logical inconsistencies in this the stack. So if you leave it there for a long period of time, you're increasing the chance of being detected by Eclipse, et cetera, or that an hunter is just, just go there and see it and do, do a bit more um, analysis, manual analysis on, on the thread call stack. Um, of course, another, another, another point is that this technique uh, can be used wherever you use return address spoofing as an arrangement. You can use sleep encryption. I released a POC uh, not, not long ago about how to, you can integrate uh, sleep encryption technique to, 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 this te to, this, um, to this technique, to this stack spoofing technique. Uh, but it adds a layer of complexity which is not uh, always easy 
to manage. So a word of caution if you are trying to integrate this in your own implant. And yeah, I think pretty much it's, it's everything. Um, thanks a lot for joining us and if you have any questions, <laughs> thank you. If you want, we are at the start. What? Sorry? Yeah. So uh, if there's time, we're happy to take questions. But I think he's also saying if you want to meet up with us after the talk, we'll be happy to talk to anyone who wants to yeah. ask any questions. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot.